choir and the worship team for leading us in worship. Would you hear a word from the Lord? This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Fathers, we gather this morning to give thanksgiving to you for your work of grace and ministry among these, this body of Christ. We do pray that you would open the eyes of our heart and the eyes of our spirit, that we would be aware and mindful of all of your manifold grace. And stir within us, because of that, the hope that we have to look forward to the future of how you will continue to be at work in and through this church. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. A couple weeks ago, we started this long, slow walk through the book of Philippians. This is Paul's letter to the saints in Philippi. A couple weeks ago, we saw how that, that group of saints came to be, how that church was birthed, how God, uh, through His Holy Spirit, specifically sent Paul and the rest of the missionary team to this specific place, made His light shine in this spiritual darkness. We saw how God uh, called Lydia, st- opened her heart to respond to the things that Paul had been speaking to her. We saw the spiritual battle that was taking place as, as the spiritual forces of darkness and the Holy Spirit were engaged when Paul cast out that demon. We, we saw Jesus' words coming true. Jesus told the disciples, they'll hate you because they hate me. And we saw Paul's persecution and being beaten and thrown in prison. But then we saw God's sovereignty over creation itself. Sends the earthquake, prison doors open, and we see the, saw the conversion of that jailer. And so when Paul leaves the city of Philippi, there is this church that has been birthed. It is meeting probably in Lydia's house. And Paul has very fond memories of this church for good reason. That's quite an experience to share together to see the birth of a church. And this was not just a one-off mission trip that he took to Philippi and never crossed their path again. He has this long, ongoing relationship with them, ongoing partnership with the gospel. And so he writes this letter. And this letter is basically one long thank you note to the church His thanksgiving to God for them. I want us to read once again this opening paragraph. And I hope what you'll see as we read this, this is Paul's prayer. Notice how his prayer begins with thanksgiving and then it ends in intercession. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for y'all, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, And I'm sure of this, that he began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's right for me to feel this way about you, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. You see how this whole paragraph really is his prayer. He begins in thanksgiving, and that thanksgiving flows over into intercession as he prays for the church. And I want us to focus this morning on verses 9, 10, and 11 because this is the heartbeat of his prayer for the church. And I want you to see five categories of things that he's praying for the church. You know, the first thing he prays for them is that their love would continue to abound and abound. And Paul doesn't say this because he knows them to be a loveless church. You were such a miserable lot of people. I pray that God would teach you to love because you were loveless when I left you, and I hope God will teach you. That's not what he's praying. He's praying out of thanksgiving for them. He has experienced their love in very tangible, real ways. As we read through the rest of this letter, Paul is going to talk about how they prayed for him, and he credits their prayer to deliver him out of a very serious situation. He talks about how they sent one of their own, Epaphroditus, to minister to him while he was in prison. 
Because in those days when you were in prison, all your needs had to be provided for somebody on the outside. And if you didn't have somebody on the outside, you were really in a world of hurt. And so they sent Epaphroditus to minister to him on their behalf. Chapter 4 talks about how they financially supported him on multiple occasions. And so he's got this ongoing experience where he experiences their love in a very real, tangible way. And so out of thanksgiving for that, he comes to his prayer of intercession. And what does he pray? I, I pray that God would cause that to abound more and more and more, that you would continue to abound in love like I have experienced and that you would continue in that. Second big category that he prays is that they they would abound in what I'm going to call spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. He specifically says he prays that they would grow in their knowledge, but he has these three things connected. Knowledge, discernment, but also approving what is excellent. It, it, it wasn't just the, the knowledge of the gospel, the understanding of the gospel, the understanding of Scripture, stuff that's maybe in our head, but he wants it to move down and impact and transform our heart, discernment, or some translations talk about depth of insight. But even beyond that, that it begins to impact our affections, what we approve, what we desire, that we, we approve that which is excellent. And, and Paul knew this to be a group of people. They understood the gospel. They understood the scriptures. It was transforming their heart down to their affections. And he's praying for them that that would continue more and more and more. There's little more miserable than a group of religious people who have a lot of knowledge about religious stuff in their head and it never gets down to their heart and it never transforms their affections, right? And Paul's prayer, he said, that's not what I experienced in you. And so his prayer for them is they would continue to abound more and more in spiritual wisdom. The third big category that he prays for them is that their, their righteousness would grow, that they would continue to abound in righteousness. He used this phrase that they would be pure and blameless at the day of Christ, that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And on one hand, it's talking about their salvation, their salvation that they have a righteousness that has come from Christ. In chapter 3, Paul is going to talk about his personal testimony. And he says, I I did not want to have a righteousness of my own, but I wanted a righteousness that comes from God by faith. And so this is the kind of righteousness that they experienced, Lydia, the jailer, and the rest of the church, coming to that place where you realize that you are a sinner, separated from God. There's nothing that you can do to, to reconnect yourself with God, and yet God loves you, and so God has done something for you so that you can be reconciled with Him, sent His Son as atoning death on the cross. By the way, our Scripture memory verse in the bulletin this week, Christ suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we may be brought near to God. This is God's love for us to do that in our lives. And then by grace through faith, as we're reborn and born again and born from above, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit begins to transform us from the inside out. It's that righteousness that the church knew, and he's praying that they would continue to know that righteousness, but also to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. So the fruit of righteousness, at least to me, begins to think about our sanctification, the the work of the righteousness that's inside of us, the fruit of that as we are transformed into the image of Christ. But I think the key phrase of that is to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus Christ. It was not a righteousness of their own, but it was a righteousness that comes through. Through Jesus Christ. These songs that we sang this morning, dressed in His righteousness alone. That's how we are uh, expecting the return of our Lord and Savior. You know, I said a few minutes ago, there's nothing more miserable than a religious people who have lots of knowledge, but it never gets to their heart. I guess that's not completely true. The most miserable people are those who have lots of religious knowledge and never gets to their heart, and it never transforms their affection, and they're self-righteous. That's a miserable group of people. That's the Pharisees that Jesus was speaking against all the time. They were convinced of their own self-righteousness, which usually says, I'm good, which usually turns into, I'm better than you. And yet this was a group of people that they understood that their righteousness came through Christ, and he was praying that that would continue and grow, and the fruit of their righteousness would continue and grow. Fourth big thing he's praying for them is that they, they would abound in hope of the full gospel. Bound in the hope of the full gospel. He, he, taught, he mentions here the day of Christ, that you would be pure and blameless at the day of Christ. This is a phrase that's going to show up several times in the letter that we're going to read. We've already, it was twice in this paragraph. 
He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. His prayer is that they will be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Later on in chapter 2, his prayer is that they will be holding fast to the word of life so that at the day of Christ, Paul's work would not be in vain. Uh, in chapter 3, he doesn't use the word day of Christ, but he talks about how we're awaiting the Savior who will return and transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And then in chapter 4, again, he doesn't use the phrase day of Christ, but he talks about those rejoicing that their name is written in the book of life. So we talk about the day of Christ and the return of Christ. Well, what's going to happen at the return of Christ? It's going to be a time of judgment. Well, how are we going to be spared from that judgment? Well, it's based upon what happened in the first coming, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, His atoning death. And that's the way that we can be excited when Christ returns. How is our name written in the Lamb's book of life? Well, it's because of what Christ did on the cross. How in the world can we be pure and blameless at the day of Christ? How are we going to hold fast on the day of Christ? Well, because it's the work of the Holy Spirit holding on to us, transforming in the day. So it's rejoicing in the, the full arc of the gospel story. And Paul's prayer for them is that they would continue to abide in that hope and grow in that hope and that that hope would change their life. In the last category of his prayers, he's, he's praying for them that they would abound in giving glory to God. That's how his prayer ends, to the glory and praise of God. It was not about making a name for themselves. It was not about becoming a world-famous church. It was not about Lydia becoming famous or the Jaywer becoming famous. But it was all about lifting up the name of Jesus in the city of Philippi. Incredible prayer. All this thanksgiving that he gives for the church. It's why he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you. I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ. I hold you in my heart. I thank my God when I remember you. And as he rejoices in that thanksgiving, it leads him to say, I've seen God do this in among you. And my prayer is that God would continue to do that more and more and more. So this morning, if you will allow me a few moments... I'm going to practice a little preacherly plagiarism. I'm just going to steal Paul's sermon this morning. And I'm just going to follow his pattern to give thanks to God for a specific church, a specific collection of saints, a specific eyewitness of God's grace in this place, and that would lead us to a time of praying for God to continue to do more and more. Because like the Apostle Paul gave thanks for this church. I thank God for this church. I thank God for His grace and His amazing mercy upon this church and His presence in this church. And like the Apostle Paul, for the last 20 years, I have been watching a group of saints abounding in love. Abounding in love. If, if you don't hear anything else from me today, I, I hope that you will hear this. You have loved me and my family well, bountifully well. And I am very well aware that not every pastor can say that. I think David Bowman, uh, director of our Tarrant Baptist Association, is here somewhere. Where are you at? The Holy Spirit is not directing my gaze. Anyway, uh, but I'm sure he gets calls every Monday morning of those who are not being loved well by their church. My eyewitness testimony to you is this. You have abounded in love for me and my family for the last 20 years, and I thank God for that. I, uh, from the very beginning, I mean, you've loved us from the very beginning. One of my earliest memories of the church, Milt Bachman, who's now one of our saints in the great cloud of witnesses. Milt and Diane came to our house with, with teddy bears and TCU shirts for all the family. You know, welcome to Fort Worth, root for the home team kind of thing. Uh, Nelda Freeman helping us find a house when she was going through cancer treatments. And even when she wasn't able to be there, she was sending all of her resources in the city to help us. From the very beginning of uh, loving us, I, I can tell more and more stories like that, but I'd, I'd really like just to say a few things that I think that pastors can say and, and pastors only. Can I thank you today? You have loved me and you've loved our family well by letting my kids grow up in this church and just be kids and not feel the burden of having to be pastor's kids. Thank you for that. Um, you've loved my kids. You continue to love my kids. Guys, y'all been gone from this church for years. And almost every Sunday, someone will ask, how's Kate and Alyssa doing? What's Bailey up to? Did Ainsley enjoy teaching? You know, every Sunday, someone is asking about you and I'm so grateful for that and it's not just our kids 
Blake's kids, Tim's kids, I see you treat them as well the same way. The uh, Wednesday, I was out in the lobby uh, waiting to meet someone, and I won't mention names not to embarrass people, but uh, one of our church members walked in the door, and one of Blake's kids ran across the, the lobby and gave her a big hug. And I'm watching this take place, and I don't even know how those two circles cross in church ministry. I'm trying to think, how do those two people even know each other? And yet here is the, the love that one of your staff's children feels just when you walk in the door. That is a tremendous gift that you may never understand. Thank you. Thank you for allowing Kelly to be Kelly and not have to live under the burden of being pastor's wife. Thank you for letting me be an introvert. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know I'm an introvert, I'd like to welcome you to First Baptist because this is obviously your first Sunday here. Um, Thank you. You, you provide a, a sabbatical for me every seven years just because you care for me. You gifted us with a cruise for our 10-year anniversary, one of our great family memories that we have, and that was a gift from you. Um, and on a personal note, I mean, all this is personal, I guess, uh, earlier this year when I shared with the congregation that, that my mom was diagnosed with cancer, I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me and told me that they are praying for my mom, praying for her. Wednesday, I was in the lobby again, and someone came up to me and said, you know, we were praying for your mom in Sunday school, and I just want to know, how is your mom doing? I made a hospital visit this week, and I walk into the room, and I'm not making this up. She says to me, and I quote, I know you're here to check on me, but first, I want to know, how is your mom doing? That is the kind of love that we have experienced in this church. And I just cannot thank you enough for how you've loved us and loved us well. And I'll just, I'll tell you this, and I've practiced saying this to not embarrass myself, but when I meet you in public, grocery store, restaurant, whatever, and you introduce me and you call me my pastor, you have no idea the amount of honor that lays upon me. And how much that means to me. Thank you for loving me and my family well for 20 years. And, and I see you abound in love for one another as well. I do. When I make a hospital visit, I'm hardly ever the first church member there. When I do a funeral, there's dozens of people who have come from our church for no other reason, just to love the family and to support the family. I watch you at baby showers, just overwhelm first-time moms with more stuff than's going to fit in their house. It's just a way that you love each other. I hear of little ways that y'all love and uh, support and provide for each other that I'm probably not supposed to know, but you assume I know because I'm pastor, and so you let it slip, and you're like, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to say that. I hear that kind of stuff all the time. This is a church that knows how to love each other well, and I thank you for that. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you for abounding in love for one another. But like Apostle Paul for the last 20 years, I've been watching a group of saints abounding in spiritual wisdom. Remember I said it's a miserable group of people that have a lot of spiritual knowledge up here that never transforms the heart and never transforms the affections. And this is a group of people, this is a body of Christ. You, you love the Lord, you love the Scriptures, you love the Gospel, you love the Word of God, but it's not just up here. It has transformed your heart, it's transformed your affections and it, it, it's a, there's a lot of spiritual wisdom that is in this place. And I'm so grateful for that. And it's a lot of fun and quite challenging to preach to this group of people every Sunday morning. Because you love the Bible, and you know the Bible, and you're students of Scripture, and your knowledge is abounding and bounding and bounding. So I just can't get up here and wing it. I mean, I've got to make sure I rightly understand the text. I've got to make sure that I've got it in context. I've got to, to make sure how other scriptures might impact this particular scripture. I've got to think theological. What are the theological implications of, of what is coming out of this scripture? What are some natural questions of, of faith that we would ask because we've read this scripture? And the reason I've got to do all that is because I know in the lobby after church, Someone is going to have a conversation with me, and not a pick holes in the sermon conversation, not a this is where you were wrong conversation, but a conversation by a fellow lover of the Word of God who is engaging in the Scripture that morning, 
and comes out of that and say, comes and says, Pastor, I've been studying this for several weeks and the Lord's been trying to teach me this and I've been studying this. And then the scripture you read this morning made me think about this and this is how God, and what do you think about this? And we'll have a 10-minute conversation and all we're doing is just chewing on scripture together. And that is a lot of fun. And I thank you for that. Some, of, some people have asked me if I get nervous preaching because we have so many seminary professors you know, part of our church. This is one of, as Joe mentioned earlier, a really neat growing partnership. Uh, and I can honestly say to you, I don't. Uh, and first, one reason is I've just gotten to know these guys. I, I know their hearts. They love the Lord. They love the scriptures. They love this church. They don't really have a critical bone in their body. And so they're very encouraging to me. And that's one reason. But the second reason, just to be honest, I've been preaching in front of seminary types for 20 years. No offense, Dr. Dockery. These people may not have their PhD, but they know Scripture. They love Scripture. They have studied Scripture. And so I've been preaching in front of seminary types for 20 years. And I am so grateful to do that. You come with such high expectations of the sermon. And the reason is not because you have high expectations of me. It's because you have high expectations of Scripture. You believe it to be the living Word of God. You believe it to be profitable for teaching, correction, training, and righteousness. You believe the promise that we're two or more gathered in my name. Jesus is there. And so you have full expectation if a body of Christ is going to join together and open the Word of God, God is going to speak. And you have high expectations. And it is a lot of fun to preach to that crowd. Thank you for being a church that is abounding in spiritual wisdom. Just like Paul, for the last 20 years, I've been watching a group of saints abounding in righteousness through Christ. That was his prayer. They would be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. They would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Again, miserable lot of people, religious people, to be filled with head knowledge, doesn't get to the heart, doesn't get to their affections, and they're filled with self-righteousness. But it's a beautiful group of people that realize that all of the righteousness that they have has come from the work of Christ that is in their life. And any fruit of righteousness that anyone else might be able to point to, what they're really pointing to is the work of Christ in their life. I can say this with a straight face. Some of the godliest people I have ever met either have been or currently are members of this church. Uh, I was looking at statistics a lot this week, just looking at some numbers. I've preach 170 funerals over the last 20 years. It's a lot of funerals. And as I was going through the list and counting names, just reminded, I won't read off 170, but can I remind you of a few? Ruth Fair, Clarence and Melba Stice, Betty Kaysen, Ken Curry, Alita Porter, Carl Peterson, Ora Blassingame, James and Mert Moore, Guy and Gwen Haverstock, Waylon and Evelyn Keith, Janita Wallace, Ann Keith, Fred and Joy Allen, Gary Allen, or as my kids know him, Cheeseburger. It's a whole different story. There have been amazing saints that have been a part of this fellowship. Godly people who demonstrated what it looks like to have the righteousness that is in Christ transform your life and to be filled with that fruit. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church that gets that. I'm thankful to be part of a church where you individually understand when someone else is experiencing the fruit of your righteousness in Christ, you understand what that means. So if, if you have the gift of hospitality, and many of you do, and you are able to share hospitality and another person experiences God's love through you and you see them feel God's love through you, you understand what's going on. You understand that you have just had the blessing to be an instrument of God at work in you through them or through you to touch them and you are amazed by it and what that causes you to do is rejoice in the righteousness that is in Christ and the spirit that is within you. If you have the gift of generosity, and many of you do as well, it's the same thing. You understand what's taking place. God's given you some resources and then prompted you to share those resources. And you get to see this process of someone who's praying to God to have a need met, and it's met through you. And you get to be an eyewitness to all this and watch it and to observe it. And you realize what's going on. It's not that, gee, I'm a generous person. It's how incredible is this to be part of the righteousness that is through Christ and His gracious work through us. And it's neat to be a part of a church that gets that. 
For 20 years, I've been enjoying the fruit of your righteousness in Christ. I've had the privilege over 20 years of baptizing 244 people. That's incredible. That is the fruit of your righteousness. That's parents making disciples of their children. That's our children's Sunday school department systematically teaching the Word of God. That's our Awana workers who every week are helping them to memorize Scripture and understand scriptural truth. That's our preteen ministry, our student ministry. That's the fruit of your righteousness in Christ, and I get to be a part of that. I've officiated 55 weddings over 20 years. That's the fruit of righteousness in Christ. What happens at a wedding when God takes two and forms them into one? God is at work in that, and I get to be a part of that. Over 20 years, we've watched as God's grace has been poured out upon this church. In 2004, when I became pastor, the average Sunday morning worship attendance was 269. To date this year, our average worship attendance is 356. That's an increase of a third. That is the fruit of God's righteousness upon this church. That is God's manifold grace in us. And I would say to you today very clearly, whatever you have enjoyed or have been blessed or been ministered to through me, understand that is Christ in me and it is not me. Whatever has annoyed you, that's me. (laughs) Right? Paul said to the Corinthian church, he says, what do you have that you have not received as a gift? And if you received it as a gift, why are you bragging about it? It's just God at work through you. I'm grateful to be a part of a church who understands that. Just like Paul, for the last 20 years, I've been watching a group of saints abounding in the hope of the full gospel. The full gospel story from salvation, sanctification, glorification, the fact that we've been called out of this world. We are born above, born, born from above, born again, born with the Spirit, called out of this world to follow a new master And as a result of that, we are putting our hope in eternal treasures. And I thank God to be part of a church that is abounding in hope in the full gospel story from the crucifixion to the resurrection to the second coming. Again, 244 baptisms. 244 people stood before this church when I was as pastor, publicly identifying with Christ, rejoicing in the righteousness that comes with Christ in the hope of the gospel. But even those 170 funerals, That's 170 families gathering together and rejoicing in the hope of the gospel and the hope of eternal life. Because you understand and you get the hope of the full gospel experience. And that fixes our hope today. Where is our hope today? Is it in the things of this world? No, it is in the very presence of the Spirit of God in us personally and in us in a church. And I'm glad to be part of a church that is abounding in hope in the full gospel. And finally, like Paul, for the last 20 years, I've been watching a group of saints abounding and giving glory to God. One of the things I like about the the DNA of this church is we are not self-promoters. It's not a look at me. It is a look at the Christ that is in me. It is not I, but it's Christ in me. And our, our hope of whether you are making donations to Vacation Bible School. It's not because you want to get credit of how many crayons you gave. It's because you want to be part of the the name of Jesus being famous in our community. And on and on I could list. You get that as a church and uh, rejoice in that. And I hope that what is happening on this day, that that's what we're doing. That today really is a celebration of 20 years of God's grace. God's gracious work in us, through us, and around us. And I hope at the end of this day, this is what happens. All will be done to the glory and to the praise of God. And so I want to follow with the model of the Apostle Paul, that my thanksgiving for this specific church also leads into my intercession for this specific church as well. And I would like for us to pray together Paul's prayer for the church in Philippi, that what we've seen God do in our midst in the past, that we would pray that God would continue to do that in our midst in the future. And if you would join me in that prayer, I'd ask you to do this. Would you please stand? And I'm going to make a, a prayer statement, and if you agree with that, and if you will commit to praying for that, and that would be part of your prayer, would you just say amen with me? So as we pray together, may the Lord cause us to abound in love more and more. Amen? Amen. amen. May the Lord cause us to abound in knowledge and discernment and to approve that which is excellent. Amen. Amen. 
May the Lord cause us to abound in righteousness that is through Christ. Amen? Amen. And may the Lord cause us to abound in hope in the full gospel. Amen? Amen? And may the Lord cause us to abound in giving Him glory and praise. Amen?